Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous. Merci d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. I'm Welcome Ted. Welcome all. Thank you for being here today. And Humanities Research Council, what we call SHRC. For short, I'd like to acknowledge that SHRC's offices are situated on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And as we are meeting in a virtual environment and from various locations, we also acknowledge from coast to coast to coast the ancestral and traditional territory of all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people who call this land home. I'm very pleased on behalf of SHIRK to present this next event in our public talk series, In Conversation With, which we offer in partnership with The Conversation Canada. Le CRSH est l'organisme fédéral de financement de la recherche au Canada. We are the federal organization for financing in Canada, which supports research in the field of human sciences, researchers and students allow to better understand the human condition, the thought and human behavior of cultures and the functioning of society. The work of the specialists and the disciplines have never been as essential to meet the challenges to which society is face and to seize new opportunities, whether they're among others, the recovery following the pandemic, climate change, the environment, or reconciliation with Indigenous people. To partner with The Conversation Canada to bring the perspectives of some of Canada's best and brightest scholars to the public. These talks provide a unique forum where we hear directly from academics who have important views based on scientific research to share. Their research can enrich our understanding of people and world affairs. Today, our distinguished guest is Jan Grabowski, a professor in the Department of History at the University of Ottawa. He's dedicated his 30-year career to studying the history of the Holocaust in Poland. Don Lacotte's recherche, the Professor Grabowski. During his research, Professor Grabowski is looking at the circumstances of the extermination of Jews in Poland as well as the relationships between Jews and Polish people from 1939 to 1945. He's particularly interested in what happened to the Jewish population after the liquidation of the urban ghettos. Professor Grabowski has published several works, including Hunt for the Jews, Betrayal and Murder in German-Occupied Poland. And uh, he won the Literary Award Yad Vashem for research on the Holocaust in 2014. Insight Award for his critical research into understanding the multifaceted nature of the Holocaust and refuting increasing Holocaust distortion. Professor Grabowski is joined today by Ibrahim Dair. Ibrahim is an editor at the Culture and Society Desk at The Conversation Canada. He holds degrees in both journalism and conflict analysis and resolution. So I want to thank all of you again for joining the conversation. Je vous remercie encore une fois d'être des nôtres. And now I thank I, you once again for being among us. And Professor Grabowski, take it away. Well, thank you, Ted, for that introduction and welcome, everyone. Um, before we begin, I just have a few quick words. Um, I'd like to let our audience know that both closed captioning and simultaneous interpretation are available for this event. For closed captioning, you can click upon the link below the video screen. And for simultaneous interpretation, select the globe language icon in the top right of the screen. Um, today's interview will be followed by a Q&A, so please submit your questions at any time in English or in French using the ask a question function, which is in the top right of the platform. All right. Um, well, thanks you. Thank you so much, Professor Grabowski. I've been looking forward to this because there's there's definitely been um, a lot happening when it comes to your research in, in recent years. Um, but I wanted to start by giving us a bit of an overview, um, because I think some what strikes people uh, when reading your book is is uh, the accounts of individuals and the amount of individual testimony in there and you call your research an account of the events that happened on the margins of the Holocaust. So can you tell us what you mean there by the margins sure. and why you wanted to focus there? 
Well, thank you, Ibrahim, for this uh, question, for the introduction, Ted. Um, this uh, work of mine, margin has to be understood in a very, very broad terms. In other words, uh, uh, historians of the Holocaust uh, have been <clears throat> dividing uh, this human, let's say, scenery of this uh, catastrophe uh, into three um, interdependent parts. One was uh, this human let's say, scenery. One was the perpetrators, which we studied for decades and decades. Uh, and then we had the victims. So mainly German perpetrators, mainly the Jewish victims. And then we had this third part, which basically was everybody else in Europe, which we called bystanders. Uh, and um, this is perhaps the most, uh, we know a lot about victims, we learn a lot about uh, perpetrators, but this nebulous tens or hundreds of millions of Europeans who were somehow, you know, interacting with this, uh, one of the greatest uh, tragedies in human history, uh, we are still trying to understand what basically made people like you, like I, people who are not, let's say, involved in a major way, seemingly, uh, what made these people, ordinary people, act the way they did? So in my case, my historical lab uh, is Poland, which is a fundamentally important place because this is an area uh, where the largest Jewish community in the world, in Europe, lived, 3.3 million people. It is also an area where five out of six million Jews have been put to death, uh, and so when you talk about margins of 5 million, I'm studying most of the time fates of a few hundred thousand Jews who actually had a working chance to survive, namely uh, Jews who fled the ghettos in 1942 or 1943, who never were never delivered to the factories of death, who wanted to blend with the outside Gentile society, and that's where the things went also horribly wrong, because only very few among these hundreds of thousands actually made it until 1945. So, grosso modo, this is my area. Basically, it's in this nebulous, mysterious, horrifying area where actually the Germans had less to say about who lived and who died than actually your own neighbors. That's the time when your uh, Gentile neighbors decided whether you lived or died, rather than Germans who didn't really have a clue where these Jews are hiding. So this is what makes this uh, study, this research so complex, uh, also so very important because it teaches us certain truths about ourselves. Uh, about ourselves, about human condition under extreme pressure. If that was answers, you know, in very broad terms, uh, the question you asked. Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I wanted to get into this uh, this more in depth because it's a it's an interesting part of your research. The, trying to understand this issue of bystanders, and you know, you say that it's it's essentially an obsolete idea to say that there are bystanders in in the Holocaust. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about yeah. what exactly it was uh, that you saw in your research that, you know, right. brought you to this conclusion? Yeah, the thing is that, you know, the term bystanding implies a degree of uh, distance, of, uh, let's say, indifference. Uh, and uh, the closer you move to the epicenter of the Holocaust, the closer you move, in other words, to places like uh, uh, Ukraine, like Poland, like uh, Lithuania, that's where actually Holocaust physically has been committed. So the less likely you are to find people who could not be affected. Now, you can argue, and some of my colleagues in Holland uh, or in France argue that an average uh, Dutch person or French person could have simply been totally oblivious uh, to things which happened to Jews. Uh, they knew that there was persecution, uh, that there were certain restrictions um, on the Jews, but they did not, didn't have to know that actually their Jewish neighbors, once they were deported to the East, have been put to death. Uh, 
Now, in the case of places like Poland, this uh, explanation falls apart. So my study is to look exactly what happened in these crucial times, how this Jewish tragedy was a public knowledge. In other words, oftentimes when students of history or even people who are vaguely interested in history, when they look at, let's say, a book which says, which talks about the ghettos, our perception of the ghettos probably is for those of us who know something, are these big walls, uh, barbed wire, uh, enclosed, uh, closed off existence. Uh, well, it's not true. I mean, in Poland in 1941, 42, um, 70% of Jews, uh, over 2 million of them, lived actually in so called open ghettos. They were part, you know, of uh, local towns. There were hundreds of ghettos which were open to the, to the public, so to say. Everyone could see people starving in these so called open ghettos. And then when the moment came when the Germans decided to liquidate, as they called the ghettos. Basically, it was a scene, an orgy of uh, horrifying violence, something that we cannot, even when you come from areas which were somehow impacted by war, you can hardly imagine the level, because here you are talking not about war, you are talking about mass murder of civilian population, women, children, uh, slaughtered in these open spaces in full sight of everybody. So the problem is that if you are repeatedly hundreds and hundreds of times across the land, if you have this explosion of horrible violence perpetrated on in full sight of the mainstream society, uh, millions of people are, they ca cannot remain indifferent. In other words, they cannot pretend that they have not seen the horror because they have to react whether they want or not, because lack of reaction is already reaction, right? Um, your, your gesture of turning your head away from this horror which transpires on the street simply in front of you is already a moral choice. Not that I'm trying to assign blame, but the thing is that we have to be conscious that becoming a by remaining a bystander in Eastern Europe, in Central Europe, in 1941, 42, 43, and so on, was, and that's my, let's say, hypothesis, which I will defend and ready to defend, was purely and simply impossible. Uh, and then, you know, when you have the years which ensued, uh, the years of these uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews who begged for mercy, who were trying to hide, desperately fighting for their survival. They also led this horrifying struggle in full sight of local populations. So all of this, you know, adds these layers of horror. At the same time, it sheds light on how our human nature works. Who are the people who are in these horrifying circumstances willing to risk their freedom or even their life to offer helping hand to the dying people who are not their cousins, who are aliens. And then on the flip side, you can see the damage done by ideology of hate. And this is something what makes this study of Holocaust, you can, you can see how today, uh, various regimes uh, recycle the messages of hate nearly word after word taken from 1942, 1943, and applying them to people they dislike today in 2022 or 2023 or 2015. You take your pick. So this is what uh, this, this study of the Holocaust never is uh, obsolete. Unfortunately, it's not. Yeah, and I definitely want to get to more recent events. Um, but before we do, another thing that was interesting was, um, as I said, the, the 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 sheer amount of of individual accounts that you have collected. And I was wondering if you could tell us about these sources. I mean, how is it that you know they came to us today that they were recorded and collected? Yeah. 
Well, you know, the thing is that uh, someone someone noted Hitler decided to to, to uh, exterminate, to murder, uh, perhaps the most literate part of humanity, at least in European, definitely in European circumstances. Um, now, there was a profound tradition uh, among the Jews of writing. That's one, and the second. During the war, very quickly, uh, the Jews dis well, decided, or rather came to understand, that something unprecedented was happening to them. And that this unprecedented situation required a living record, that even if they had to die, they had to leave record. So actually, Holocaust has become, uh, despite its uh, extraordinary extent and this the horrible human uh, cost uh, has become one of the better documents, despite the attempts by the Germans to make it obscure and absolutely invisible, has left a lot of written, uh, of written uh, sources. And we do have hundreds and hundreds of diaries written by people who I call unsurvivors, people who their last will was to simply document their fate, not to leave this world without leaving the record of their tragedy, of their suffering, of their children's suffering. So we have the, something that I call Jewish memory, which is much more profound. Now, look, if you look at Polish Jews, uh, we are talking about a survival ratio of 1%. I mean, imagine a genocide so complete, so total, that out of 100 Jews who came under German occupation, Polish Jews, one would survive. So you can, can you imagine a more complete form of genocide than here uh, in Poland? Practically impossible. Despite this, we have this ample, this huge collection of Jewish memory, uh, so of unsurvivors, but at the same time also survivors. So after the war, there were about 50, 40,000, we don't know exactly how many, perhaps 40,000 or perhaps 35,000 of survivors who made it through the war uh, in terms of Polish Jews. And they knew um, that their absolute obligation or the requirement was to leave uh, the record. And in 1945, six and seven, so very, very soon after the end of the war, uh, the Jews formed special uh, committees, historical committees, where they gave their testimonies. And we have 7,000 of these from Poland alone. And these testimonies are very short. They are one, two, three pages max. But these one, two, three pages basically give you the story of the destruction of their home, of their shtetl, of their village, of their close ones. And when you add these things up, I mean, they are this is a powerful, shattering testimony. And then you have uh, the so-called German memory, which is very, very oblique, uh, but for a historian like myself, very important. So when I go to Germany, I look at the records interrogation, for instance, into German, the entire official apparatus, the, the state machinery of destruction. Now, the Germans had a policy that not to leave anything in writing. But if you are murdering six million people, there is no way not to leave traces uh, in writing. So we have the, the sticky fingers of Nazi officials, German officials, all over these uh, collect archival collections, uh, starting with, uh, with the famous records of trains, special trains delivering people on time to places like Auschwitz, Treblinka, Beuzet, Sobibor, Majdanek, you name it. Uh, we have them uh, leaving full and uh, and then returning empty. Um, uh, and the, the documents, we so-called documents of destruction. And then <clears throat> you have the interrogations, the depositions of Germans who were um, uh, deposited or interrogated by German courts in 1960s, 70s. Also valuable if you know how to approach them. And then you have the memory of bystanders, which is something I am of so-called bystanders, which I am working. Uh, in my case, it's uh, memories, for instance, of simple Polish peasants who were brought to court in 1945 or 46, testifying about what has happened in their uh, in their communities when someone was, ac was accused of one thing or another. And we have this is a recently got recently. Um, a these are collections which only recently became available to historians 10, 15 years ago, 
uh, literally millions of pages, which are perhaps the last trove of this kind of Holocaust-related documents, uh, core documents from immediately post-war period, which shed light on this alleged bystander behavior. So Polish memory in this case. So all of these things add up and they allow us to as I mentioned, seek answers, look for answers, very troubling, with very troubling answers sometimes about moral conditions of each and every society. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at Polish society, but these uh, things, these hypotheses and uh, conclusions are applicable across uh, the board. Definitely. And uh, I, I want to now turn to more recent uh, events um, because this, this, idea of testimony has been uh i guess con brought some controversy to your uh, to your books especially in poland and uh, the polish league against defamation brought a lawsuit against you and your co-author saying that you had uh essentially defamed a person who was mentioned uh in your book um so so can you well first tell us who the polish league against defamation are and yeah. what exactly the case was about Right. I mean, the case became a bit of a cause celeb at a certain point, although I I was not happy to be at the midst of this controversy. But the thing is that uh, um, five years ago, I published, co-published and co-authored a book, a two-volume, huge academic work, nine authors. Uh, I, I was co-editor-in-chief of this uh, and the book uh, was published in Poland right in the middle of the so-called Polish Holocaust law controversy, where the nationalistic authorities in Poland in power since 2015 uh, decided in their wisdom to change the law so that uh, people, independent uh, historians, were threatened with, or educators, were threatened with uh, prison terms of up to three years uh, for, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for um, speaking the truth, writing the truth about uh, the uh, Holocaust-related history. Uh, so to make a long story short, uh, our book arrived uh, without any planning of ours exactly at the time, uh, and it created quite uh, a strong reaction on the part of the authorities. Now, uh, the authorities in Poland fund for them this struggle for history, or rather the defense of national mythology is one of the central points of their agenda. It's something that consolidates their elect nationalistic electorate. So they are willing to invest uh, their powers and money in this project. So here we had a lawsuit filed allegedly by a elderly woman who felt that our book, uh, one paragraph in one 1,600 pages, written by my colleague, by the way, um, uh, that it slandered the memory of her long deceased uncle. I mean, not the, a lawsuit of this would have been completely impossible in normal ro uh, world, but uh, in, as I was told by one of my uh, lawyer friends from Canada, uh, but in Poland, uh, it was entirely possible. So we were sued actually by this elderly lady, but it became very quickly obvious that uh, behind this lady, there was an organization they are called uh, Polish Anti-Defamation League. It's an organization, it's basically a proxy for the Polish authorities, funded uh, in large part by the Polish authorities uh, doing their bidding. And this was simply uh, the government striking back at uh, independent critical historians. Uh, so the uh, the trial went through different phases and it lasted nearly two and a half years. Uh, in the end, we were vindicated, we won, the, the lawsuit on appeal has been dismissed. But what was really important was that we actually lost in the first instance. And the justification of the lower court verdict was nothing short of brutal and threatening to all historians around the world. And we, I have to say, received a huge, huge wave of support from international uh, academia, including my colleagues from Canada, from the United States, the American Historical Association, the Canadian Historical Association stood firm behind us. The University of Ottawa was extremely um, uh, here important to, so in their support for me. So what in Polish court transpired was an, was an onslaught, an attack on profession of historian per se. It was clear that the authorities wanted to use this case in order to freeze debate, to muzzle independent historians, and they introduced into the verdict something called the right to national dignity and pride. Now, there is no way 
a, a lawyer can can um, uh, define legally define national pride. Now, once you have in legal jurisprudence this kind of threat, well, anyone can feel their national pride upset for one reason or another. So you can easily, and there was much more, but we don't have the time here. But the thing is that uh, this trial simply was a trial balloon, so to say. Um, uh, and this uh, history of the Holocaust was under attack, but basically our notion of to whom history belongs, who can decide uh, what is the historical record was on, on trial here. So for the time being, uh, we, uh, my, me and my colleagues, we won the case, but the, it's a battle which we won, but the war is far from over. Uh, I heard recently that uh, the authorities have created a new law, which allows them in Poland, allows them actually to subvert even the legal judgments uh, on appeal. One, they can now still uh, send it to a um, Supreme Court. So I believe this is not the end of the story, because as I mentioned, the Defense of historical myths and the consolidation of national electorate is for the ruling nationalists very important. It's one of the crucial parts of their agenda. And mind you, this is not only I'm discussing Polish case, but uh, the governments of Hungary, of Romania, of other countries are watching very closely because actually if you can arrive at such a situation with civil litigation, not criminal litigation, then nobody really cares, right? You don't have martyrs, you don't have victims. If you go to prison, people tend to see it as, as an example of something wrong if you put historians in prison. Uh, however, if you drag them through years of civil litigation, well, that's uh, obviously a part of uh, the job, many people will say. You have to be cautious how you write your history. So this is more or less the background of the story. Mm. But, and I wanted to get maybe a bit more in into the the initial uh, uh, verdict in the in the first case where you were I think you were ordered to apologize. Uh, I mean because uh, as you you mentioned about uh, dignity and and the problems there, but I mean in order for them to to make their case, they must have had to bring an alternative testimony or alternative evidence to what you had brought in your book. So I mean this is in essence the court kind of judging which historical narrative is 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 better right and i mean as a historian what's your perspective yeah. on that the, you know it's a, you are entirely true i didn't want to go so far i didn't so i didn't think we had the time but if you ask i will be more than happy to tell you now the thing is that the 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 court or the lawyers for the other side they didn't have to look for other evidence because we as good historians that we are i and my colleagues we provided uh, the opposing evidence. But simply the thing is that according to the basic rules of my profession of history, I, as a trained historian, determine the value of my sources. There are sources which are more valuable, more, um, let's say, uh, trustworthy, and there are sources which I cite but I do not lend much credibility to them. It's uh, like with people, right? Some people you trust on the basis of your experience and some people you, ask, you, you trust less. And, and this is one of the basic, rights of every historian on the basis of their expertise, which has been, let's say, formed over decades and decades of work, that I, for instance, assign huge importance to one particular kind of source and much less so to another. In this case, we were told that we have, for instance, fundamental part in our profession of Holocaust historians is the uh, is the Jewish testimony, especially during the war and fresh after the war, um, which is unfiltered yet through time and so on. Now uh, the the court basically told us that we have no right to uh, qualify historical evidence. That if we have an evidence which says one thing and another kind of evidence which says something different, then we as historians cannot. Uh, pronounce ourselves in favor of one or the other, which basically would uh, would invalidate any kind of historical research, uh, taking away this privilege, this right of, of grading the quality of sources, basically means that we can pack up our books and go home. Um, there was more. Uh, in Warsaw Court, I heard uh, quite horrifying things, uh, for instance, um, uh, raising doubts as to Jewish testimony because it was Jewish testimony. 
Um, I don't want to go even further down this road, but you could see that a very, very disturbing things started to happen, and they do happen constantly. Certain things which you are five, seven years ago were impossible to imagine statements uh, to, to make in public domain today are, uh, are actually commonplace. So we are now in a very turbulent period of time on uh, on various counts and we need to be aware and especially as holocaust scholar i see that history of the holocaust is under siege that's for certain well it's interesting that you mentioned that you know things have changed because i'm curious about the timing of all of this because i mean you've been you've been working you've been doing this research for many years now i mean what what has changed that it's now generating this level of controversy, this level of backlash. Yeah. Well, you see, one thing is there are certain things that come together. One is that let's imagine that we had this meeting 30 years ago. I mean, the whole conversation would not have taken place because 30 years ago, it's not much in historical terms. Holocaust has not yet been this focal point of attention. Now, today, um, since the since 1990s and and more so in 23rd century, Holocaust has become, and no doubt about it, this universal benchmark of evil. You compare horrors against that benchmark. Whether it's good or wrong, that's a different story, but this is reality. So what you have is at this stage, you have governments and institutions, organizations, which are becoming preoccupied because they need to position themselves somehow toward that event. The closer you get to the Holocaust itself, geographically, the more nervous these moves are. But even in Canada, when you look at uh, publications of how our diplomatic service, let's say, behaved in 1940s, uh, the title of uh, Professor Abella's book, uh, One is Too Many, that's about, uh, the, about the policy of non-admission of Jews during the Holocaust in Canada, you can see that this that this is something that does resonate. And the second thing is that it became now more imperative because the generation of survivors of the Holocaust is practically gone. Uh, the, the last ones who remain, they are no longer capable of speaking up, of defending the record. So once you see that this generation has left us largely, you can see new narrative moving forcefully in their in the void left by them. So there are many other issues, but um, uh, you can see that. Uh, and finally, you have also this the, the difference that is crucial, perhaps, is that in the past, this is so-called Holocaust denial or Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion is basically you say that, yes, yes, Holocaust happened, but my people had nothing to do with it. This is in few words to explain it. So this Holocaust distortion is nowadays domain of states, certain states that are engaged, that are somehow involved in this form of Holocaust denial. And this is what makes this so dramatically different because how individual historians can confront the full power of a state, even a rogue state, is a matter of debate. So this, these are the challenges that, uh, that are now coming to, uh, to light. And I think that they will be more and more visible as we go along because Holocaust history of the Holocaust is not going away. And the attempts to somehow transform it into agreeable, uh, let's say palatable myth that you can use for internal consumption for your own nationalistic propaganda uh, these uh, these moves are visible aclo across the board. Well, I mean, this this whole case is fascinating. I think we could probably spend the whole hour, but uh, I wanted to turn to academic uh, freedom because, uh, as you mentioned, you you did eventually win that case on appeal. Um, so does that does that give you more confidence about uh, the the situation with academic freedom in Poland today? Well, you know, it's uh, it. The problem is that uh, in uh, the authorities actually won this um, uh, this uh, case. Why do I say it? Uh, I mean, on the surface, I was vindicated. Uh, however, 
the authorities won in this way that now in Poland, but not only in Poland, I am I am working together with historians in the groups networks of research networks from United States, Canada, France, and other countries. They have seen what happened to me, to my colleagues, years of litigation. Uh, now, teachers in Poland, underpaid, overworked, uh, do you think that they are going now to teach their, uh, their school children, their pupils in schools about uh, uh, about uh, the true historical record, no. Um, uh, now my 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 foreign uh, colleagues are now fearful. Even if they are, you know, in other countries, they don't want to risk lawsuits. So this uh, lawyers call this thing chilling atmosphere, and this chilling factor has set in. Um, uh, how far it will move is a question of debate. But one thing is, we will never know how many new interesting MAs, how many new interesting PhD theses will never be written, right? Because these uh, um, young historians uh, who now enter our profession, do they want really to confront the state? Or even if they're working in Canada on European history, let's say, do you think they want to take a, take a dip and to plunge into an area so fraught with controversy? Um, not always, certainly not all of them, sometimes perhaps, yes. So from this point of view, the authorities uh, in Poland, definitely, uh, I don't know how far conscious they are of their own success, uh, but definitely they succeeded. So the question of this, of this, uh, of this freedom of uh, writing, freedom of research, freedom of, of speech as well, and uh, they are very fragile, very fragile uh, creatures. And... Uh, they need to be protected with, uh, we in Canada, we assume that uh, that what we have is has been given for good. It has not. Uh, so basically, you know, looking at, uh, we are, we, I would say that we are on an island, which is being so slowly submerged. Now, uh, you, if you, if you look at this, uh, at this situation, uh, I often tend to repeat that an attack on historians, an attack on history, is a part of a larger attack on democracy. So it has to be understood in terms of uh, Orwell's who controls uh, the past, controls the future. Um, uh, so if you see this struggle here in my case, which is a small case still, but uh, I see it in terms of a larger attempt to undermine democratic system, unfortunately. So then in the face of this, I mean, you know, what what advice can you give to historians who may find themselves, you know, working in places where governments don't want them to uh, study certain periods of history, don't want them to be discussing things which are, you know, uncomfortable for, so we say, the state's narrative on the country. I mean, uh, well, yeah, this is one of these questions I actually don't want to take, because the thing is, uh, you, you can imagine now in places, for instance, like, let's say, Syria, like Russia, like Turkey, we are not talking about civil litigations, unpleasantness of financial or reputational nature. We are talking about historians uh, losing their lives. We are talking about historians losing their freedom, physical freedom, going to prison. Uh, so how, uh, in anyone's name, could I, uh, let's say, offer a piece of advice? This is something I even tell the same thing to my students, uh, that, that this is actually a decision that we have to make on our own based on our needs, on our, let's say, purpose, on our strength of our, let's say, uh, commitment. Uh, but this is definitely not something that I could uh, recommend a course of action. One thing I do recommend, however, is that we should not, uh, as the doctors have this saying, primum non nocere, which means, uh, first of all, don't don't contribute to the misery of someone. Don't, don't make the situation worse. Uh, and what it means is, do not, as historian, uh, lend your credibility 
to organizations, to governments, which are now working in order to subvert the history of Holocaust or any other kind of, of history, who lead this assault. Try not to take their money going to conferences they organize. Try not to, when we have in Ottawa an exhibition mounted by, let's say, Polish Institute of National Remembrance, don't go, or if you go, try to uh, show people how false narrative is being presented here. So there is a variety of things we can do uh, in terms of mobilizing our resources. But as far as advice go, no, I think I will sit this one out. Well, I am mindful of the time. So I just want to, um, again, invite uh, our attendants, our audience to submit your questions um, in either English or French using the ask a question function, which again is in the top right of the platform. Um, and maybe as we are waiting for those to come in, um, you know, I always find it interesting in these conversations uh, to know more about the academics' own journey to, to their field of study. How did you come to the study of the Holocaust? Well, in my case, it was, uh, I do have certain, let's say, family, uh, family, uh, legacy here to mention. My father, who passed away a few years, five, six years ago, uh, was a Holocaust survivor from Poland. So it was a part of my upbringing, so to say, something unmentioned or rarely mentioned at home. Uh, but uh, by and by, I was trained as a historian of 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, actually, I started my job uh, discussing the French uh, colonization of North America in 17th and 18th century and relations between, uh, between the French uh, settlers and uh, Aboriginal population. So it was a quite a long, long trip to get from all from that point in time in history and uh, geography all the way to Europe in 20th century. But among us uh, scholars of the Holocaust, we have the saying that you don't choose Holocaust, that Holocaust chooses you. And uh, in my case, it was uh, one day by nearly an accident, I came in touch with uh, documentation in Polish archives while just browsing through uh, without any, let's say, pre-planned plan, I, I stumbled on extraordinary collections of documents and this uh, Holocaust jumped out of these files on me. And then I found that no one else before touched these files. And uh, that was the beginning. And I, to be honest, never looked back. Hmm. Well, we have one question from uh, Arthur who's asking, given the complexity of history and current politics in Poland, how do you build dialogue with a range of actors about shared history with an increasingly hostile Polish audience? Well, it's a question which, uh, once again, uh, is perhaps uh, not uh, best uh, directed at me here, because, you know, uh, you ask about opening a dialogue. And uh, the thing is, I am actually not an educator. We historians have this privilege that we can open dialogue, but we also can prevail ourselves of our role, let's say, as leaving behind these containers. These containers are our books, and we let our books do our, our talking. In other words, I personally chose in back six years ago, I chose a role also of public historian. But very many people, from the, in other words, I felt obligated to enter public debates and discussions. Um, many of my colleagues do not do it. It's very, uh, it's nerve wracking. It's also uh, extremely uh, time consuming. Uh, so I, I chose to enter this exchange. However, given, as you mentioned in your question, this polarization, um, very often this is not a dialogue, but two streams of, uh, of uh, independent narratives that, meet, that do not meet even. Um, uh, that pass one another. So in my case, uh, very often the case is I leave my writings, I leave my articles, my books, uh, and let them do my bidding, so to say, for me. Uh, however, you are right. If you are, for instance, in the area of Holocaust education, then of course you need to engage more than a historian would. Um, but hopefully, in my case, what I came to understand is that uh, 
it's a very difficult struggle. In other words, trying to uh, trying to uh, convey this point to what to, to basically uh, transfer this knowledge, which is being rather universally in Poland at least rejected. Uh, is extraordinarily frustrating. Uh, imagine that after all these 25 years of publishing, not even perhaps one sentence of what I or my colleagues uh, wrote has penetrated into the school curricula, quite to the contrary. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a very, very strange situation, which no PhD programs, I must tell you, prepare future historians uh, to uh, address. And we have another question, which is asking if you could speak more about the connections you make between history, the archives, and uh, democracy. So I guess uh, how how the, the history and I guess how democracy can be corroded. What lessons? Well, the thing is that if you if you look at uh, at this entire uh, enterprise, which is uh, which is the study, and once again I'm going back to my own work, which is study of the of the Holocaust, uh, and you can see um, you can see that as I mentioned briefly before, patterns of behavior, uh, words, sentences, uh, messages of hate, uh, you can see that they are being recycled again and again and again. To give you, and this is something that uh, you can detect looking at the 1930s and 1940s, and fast forward to 2020, let's say, or 2015, uh, at the height of the uh, European refugee crisis, right, in 2015, what was extraordinary was suddenly you can see that uh, the party, for instance, that today uh, governs in Poland, started to use the imaginary, the imagery of the 1930s and 40s. The anti-Jewish stereotypes were now applied to Muslim refugees. You could see, I mean, it, were, it didn't take really a rocket engineer here. You could literally identify the, the phrases, the images, which were applied by anti-Semitic Nazi, or not only Nazi propaganda, to, um, uh, to Jews in 1930s and 40s. Now they were slapped on Muslim refugees reaching Europe through the Balkans. So you could see how this undermining of or exclusion, message of exclusion, because basically what you do here, you want to create an enemy. Now, mind you, in Poland, there was at the time not even one Muslim refugee um, in terms of perhaps there was one, but, uh, but there was absolutely no stream of refugees. However, the message of hate does not need uh, really a real, so to say, physical presence. It's in your mental world that it happens. So here, historians of the Holocaust, once again, they can be, as you can, as one can say, cannery in the mind. You can see where we are headed. We can, and that's what happened. They, my colleague, Jan, Professor Jan Tomasz Gross of Princeton University, wrote a powerful article in which, which circulated many languages, actually, in 2015, where he fell back on his knowledge of, uh, of, of the, of the, of the uh, Nazi occupation and, and said that this, the unlearned lessons, unlearned lessons of that time are now biting us on the neck. Because uh, this what has been swallowed in 1941-42 and not adequately worked through uh, during the post-war or present period now is being reused. It should never be possible. It is. So this is just an example, you know, of, of, of how these things uh, operate. And we have this uh, question which is asking you about connections um, with what's happening or parallels with, say, what's happening uh, in other parts of the world, do you see a similarity in Poland's denial of elements of its shameful history and the ongoing debate in the United States about teaching critical race theory in schools? Oh, it's uh, it's it's. I mean, the, the, these you know, it's not by accident that uh, that uh, the Polish government was absolutely thrilled with the election of President Trump. Um, the, the closest, uh, well. The, on the other hand, you could see that there was an extremely close alliance between uh, the government of Benjamin Netanyahu and the Polish government. Now, Polish government used uh, at many occasions anti-Semitic tropes, very many times. However, in terms of a kind of 
mentality, kind of stereotypes. Uh, people like the ruler of Hungary, Orban, like Benjamin Netanyahu, like President, ex-president Donald Trump, like Polish strongman Kaczyński. These people are sort of sister souls, if you will. People who understand that they, their, their understanding of the world is based on very similar uh, premises. And it translates, so when you hear, when you hear certain things about, uh, uh, about certain ideas circulated in U.S. schools um, or you know, on the state level in terms of legislation, uh, you can, uh, it goes beyond critical race theory. For instance, it goes uh, in terms of Polish government recently turned around and started attacking in a vicious way the LGBT community. Uh, if you look at the kind of language used, uh, by the way, in Putin's Russia, in Poland, in Hungary, or in certain American states uh, um, uh, against this uh, a so-called minority group, uh, once again, you can find that they are operating in on mental level on the very similar and using very similar constructs. So this is, uh, a, this is something that you can, once again, as a historian of the Holocaust, you can pinpoint it with, with dramatic precision. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned um, Poland and, and Netanyahu there, because one of the interesting outcomes of the uh, 2018 amendment uh, episode was this, this uh, I guess, agreement between Israel and Poland, where they both agreed to condemn anti-Semitism and anti-Polanism. Uh, what, what do you make of that statement? Well, this is actually a, a great example because uh, Poland was for several months after this, after the uh, voting of this Polish Holocaust law was a pariah in terms of international public opinion, international diplomacy. Uh, even the Trump administration refused to have many dealings with, with them. So they are way out of the wilderness. It was this accord with Netanyahu. Uh, Netanyahu needed desperately allies inside the European Union. Uh, now, the uh, Polish government desperately needed a Jewish voice to give them some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, vote of, uh, let's say, confidence. Uh, so these parties came together and the, uh, the recognition that uh, anti-Semitism, an ideology responsible for, a million, for six million deaths not a long time ago, is equivalent to anti polonism which doesn't exist. It's a theory which exists only in the uh, sick minds of Polish nationalists, that there is a world conspiracy to somehow doom Poland, which is simply uh, absolutely um, untrue. Uh, but if you have this kind of accord, the only reason is an absolute desperation of Israeli authorities to have an ally uh, in diplomatic terms uh, inside the European Union and absolute desperation of the uh, Polish government seeking way out of uh, diplomatic wilderness into which it condemned itself uh, some time before. And we have a couple of questions which are asking you about the reception your work has received in Poland versus uh, Polish communities elsewhere in the world. Ha and has there been a backlash um, when it comes to Poles living in Poland versus uh, expats or Polish Canadians? And what factors do you think could influence that? Uh, well, to be honest, you know, several years ago, uh, I received in my, in my modest office at the University of Ottawa, um, a mailman brought me a letter from a Polish Canadian Association or Polish Canadian Congress declaring me persona non grata, that I don't have, uh, that I'm unwelcome in Polish Canadian cultural institutions. Uh, I even framed this letter and uh, put it on the, uh, on the wall of my office. Uh, it happened many years before I received, let's say, cold wind 
from official uh, Polish uh, Polish circles. Uh, but unfortunately, among uh, many expatriates of Polish origin, who I know very well, uh, this tradition of besieged fortress is much more pronounced than even in Poland. So I wasn't entirely surprised. Uh, so the reception, I can tell one thing, the reception among of my work, among academic, uh, in academic circles has been ex excellent, has been very good. Uh, I mean, uh, I I was uh, a member of various bodies engaged in many discussions. However, once you move away from professional circles and you and you confront, let's say, that so-called so -called reading or even not so much reading audience, then of course it becomes uh, becomes uh, very different. Uh, now, but uh, as a matter of fact, uh, on the website of uh, Toronto section of so-called Canadian Polish Congress, there is a whole array of uh, uh, of um, of publications, internet-based publications, which uh, are primarily geared to stress strike against me. So you know these things are uh, they come with the territory you grow to uh, somehow to accept them as a part of uh, part of life. Life. The important thing is that uh, there is, in a case of uh, study of the Holocaust, you know that these things are not important. That there are six million dead people watching from behind your back, uh, and you have certain obligation obligation toward history to leave to strengthen the record to make it as true as humanly possible, uh, regardless of what uh, you know kind of uh, uh, smaller on, or medium size unpleasantness you are going to encounter. And so, and maybe this is the most open-ended question, but what's next then for you and your research? Well, you know, I am <clears throat> especially I am happy to uh, to, to report to Shirk because uh, Shirk has been extraordinarily uh, generous in uh, helping me to uh, um, to conduct my research. Um, uh, I am now um, uh, in late stages of a project which I call Open Ghettos Project, something I mentioned in the beginning, basically looking at uh, the uh, different uh, different through. Uh, I have been. I have been touring provincial archives in Poland uh, for the last two years from most remote areas of Poland, looking at uh, this written or other evidence of, um, of what happened in these remote areas where the Jews were actually living in open ghettos, where theoretically they could go wherever they pleased, but in reality they were confined to their uh, ghettos, which were quite uh, usually quite closed during to social supervision, to social certain mechanisms, which I study right now. All of this is still a history which remains to be, uh, to be told. Right. Well, this has been a, a, a really fascinating conversation. So thank you all so much for your questions. And thank you, Professor Grabowski, for this great interview. Thank you for um, the questions and thank you for your time. The, today's interview has been recorded and will be available on Shirk's website in a few weeks' time. Thanks again, Professor Grabowski, and I hope everyone has a great day.